Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our Sunday night Bible class. After taking uh, last week off to celebrate our Savior's resurrection, we're going to return to our study of John chapter 10 tonight. Uh, we, uh, I would just like to say that there isn't a new study uh, for tonight. So um, what I'm recommending or hoping you would do is pull up the one that we posted two weeks ago called um it's the good shepherd discourse part two letter b uh, it covers john 10 verses 19 to 21 and then has a few notes at the end about the festival of dedication which is the setting for the next um, half of john chapter 10. Uh, i'm not sure that that will take us the whole hour tonight or not so this might be a little bit of a shorter class um, but we will, that'll kind of be the plan for tonight to hopefully finish this first section of the, of the chapter, uh, the, the exposition of the parable, so to speak, or the, uh, figure of speech about the sheep and the shepherds. And then to talk a little bit about the festival of dedication and, and what makes it different or unique among the Old Testament or among the Jewish festivals. Um, <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, let's begin our study of the word with prayer. So we pray. O risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ, we give you our thanks and praise for those words that you spoke uh, first to your disciples after your resurrection, peace be with you, words that you continue to speak to us today. We know, Lord, that you do not give as the Lord gives, but uh, not give as the world gives, but you give us a uh, true peace, uh, peace with God and peace that will last into eternity. We ask that as we study your word this evening, you would fill us with that supernatural peace, that we might be ready and willing to face the troubles and trials of this sin-filled world with a confidence of faith, knowing that you are with us always to the very end of the age. We ask this in all things, in your holy name, amen. <clears throat> okay, so um, just to get us started i know it's been a, it's a little, been a little choppy since we started john 10 with the illness the week off for the illness and then we took a week off to do the catholicism thing and and then we took a week off for easter so it's been kind of choppy as we've gone through our study of, of john 10 and so i'm just going to very briefly work through the chapter as we've covered it so far just to highlight some of the big things leading into the concluding section um, so first of all, just a reminder that John chapter 10, and this may not be the greatest revelation you've ever heard, but um, John 10 is the continuation of John 9, okay, um, that the don't let the chapter division um, put a psychological barrier there. If anything, they should have put the chapter division after verse 21. So really, uh, John, what we call John 10, 1 to 21, really belongs to John chapter 9. And the way that we know that is because of the inclusio, um, that John chapter 9 is all about the man born blind, and John chapter 10, verse 21, ends with a reference to Jesus opening the eyes of a blind man. So that's an inclusio, where you start, where you we mark a section as, as being marked together by beginning and ending with the same thought. So um, Jesus it has healed the man born blind, and he has uh, had a showdown with the Jewish leaders about his authority or who, uh, his identity, um, who he is as, uh, as revealed, who revealed himself in this miracle. And really what John chapter 10 is, is a continuation of that showdown. It's a continuation of that conflict with the Jewish leaders about who he is and who he has the right, who, um, why he has the right to, to do what he does and say what he does. The difference is, or the, the, the change between 9 and 10, is the imagery that's used. In John chapter 9, of course, we had the, more the, the blindness, darkness, as, com, as opposed to um, being able to see and light that contrast. Okay, so faith is like uh, blindness, I'm sorry, unbelief is like blindness and faith is like sight or unbelief is like being in the dark and believing is being in the light. We're going to have that same basic idea being taught, but now with a different metaphor. The, the main metaphor being that Jesus is the good shepherd and he has some who are his sheep and some who are not his sheep. 
Um, and uh, chapter 10, verses 1 to 6, introduces this metaphor uh, in a very basic way, drawing on pictures that everybody in Jesus' audience would have been familiar with, a village that had a communal sheep pen where all of the, the shepherds of the community would keep their sheep at night. They would all contribute to hire one overseer who would watch over the sheep pen over, um, overnight to make sure that no unauthorized person had access to the sheep. And then in the morning, each of the shepherds would come to the gate of the sheep pen. They would give their special call, their unique call, and all of the sheep, the different flocks who had intermingled during the night would be separated. They would come out to their particular shepherd. They knew the voice of their shepherd. And the point that Jesus is, is making, the, the real point that he wants to make throughout John chapter 10, is that the difference between those who are his sheep and those who are not, the difference between believers and unbelievers, in chapter 9, it was the difference between darkness and light, or blindness and sight. In chapter 10, it's between those who know and hear the shepherd's voice and those who do not hear and do not know the shepherd's voice. That's the, the overriding image um, of John chapter 10. Uh, we have, uh, so you have some of these, the major ideas that are come, ba come back uh, again and again, things like verse 3. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his sheep by name. Um, he goes on ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. Um, they will run away from a stranger because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Okay, So you have the, these, these um, uh, images of calling and of voices and speaking and shepherd and sheep. These are the, the driving forces for John 10. So 1 to 6 is the introductory metaphor, and then what we're calling 7 to 21 is really an expansion on the metaphor. Remember, exactly what to call this is a little difficult. It's more than just an expansion because it's, it's really an exposition, um, but he's going to take a lot of the images that are in that uh, beginning in, uh, figure of speech in verses 1 to 6. He's going to play with them or manipulate them or change them in some way or another just to give us a, a slightly different perspective on the same point. There's really only one point that Christ is making. He's just making that one point in several different ways, using similar images in different ways. Um, and so in verse, uh, verse 7, Jesus goes from being the shepherd who calls the sheep to being the gate for the sheep. Um, and, and really, even that can be divided into two parts. In one sense, he's the gate that protects the sheep by keeping thieves and robbers out. So those who are before him instead of behind him, those who are in front of him and are not a part of the sheep pen, um, they're not able to get access to the sheep because Jesus is, is in the way. He's guarding or protecting them. And then right after that, the image flips. And he is the gate in the sense that the sheep go in and come out through him and find pasture through him. I'm very much a Psalm 23 kind of thought. Um, that would be verses 7 through 10. And then verses 11 through 13, we have the, the first time we actually have the words, I am the good shepherd. So another I am statement in the, in the gospel. Um, and here, what is being talked with the, the change is that Jesus is now contrasting himself with hired hands. Um, a hired hand might care about the sheep. A hired hand has been hired to take care of the sheep. But a hired hand is not going to lay down his life for a sheep. No job is worth dying for. Um, it's better to get fired than to die. And yet what makes Jesus the good sheep, the shepherd, the, the, what makes him different from the hired hands is that he lays down his life for the sheep. Um, he, he willingly gives of his life so that his sheep might have life. So this is, of course, talking about Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross where he takes our sins upon himself and he endures the punishment that our sins deserve. He dies so that we might live very much what we are celebrating now in this Easter season. Verse 14, 
that repetition of the I am statement. Uh, but notice that we return back to the idea of knowing and calling and voices again. So some of those, some of those uh, uh, key images from the opening metaphor are repeated. What is new in this paragraph is this idea that the unity that exists between the shepherd and the sheep is patterned after the unity within the Trinity, between the Father and the Son. And so there's a very intimate knowledge or knowing. Um, there's a relationship that exists between Christ and his people that is analogous in at least some way to the relationship between the Father and the Son an intimate relationship, a, 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 a relationship of love. Jesus also drops the bombshell in this paragraph that the, she, the sheep pen of Israel is not his only sheep pen, that the, the people like the blind man who hear his voice and recognize him as the good shepherd are going to be joined by those who are not of the sheep pen of Israel. In other words, Gentile believers. And so here we have um, introduced a theme that is going to become much more important in the book of glory. It's going to come kind of rise to the fore more in the book of glory, chapters 12 through 21, where Jesus is, is speaking, um, uh, will, will speak about the inclusion of the Gentiles into the church. Have Gentiles been welcomed into the Jewish religion? Okay, so Rachel's question is at this time, had Jew had Gentiles been welcomed into the Jewish religion? And the answer is sorta of, but not really. Um, we do know that at the time of Jesus and a little before that, that there were what we would call Jewish missionaries that went out among the Gentiles in the Roman Empire and tried to convince people to become Jews. Um, and there were really two different kinds of Gentiles um, that, that responded in some positive way. You did have people who made the full conversion to Judaism, which means that they submitted to circumcision and followed the, um, the prescriptions of the Mosaic law. And very often they are called converts to Judaism. And that's what the New Testament will call them, converts to Judaism. They're pretty rare, though. They are few and far between, partly because there's a social stigma that's associated with being Jewish. Um, they're very much a minority in the Roman Empire, and they're, they're a strange minority because they deny the pantheon, the pantheon which is so central to Roman culture, to, to, to the civic life of Rome. Um, so the, the, they, the fact they only believed in one God and the fact that they denied that Caesar was God or a representative of God made becoming Jewish socially disadvantageous. Also, obviously, for a, a man to submit to circumcision as an adult is an extremely painful uh, and you know debilitating step to take. And then finally, living underneath the Mosaic prescriptions, you know, that's not necessarily the you know the the most fun way to live in the world. So, um, however, we also know that there are many other Gentiles who did not fully convert to Judaism. They did not, they were not circumcised. They did not follow the Mosaic laws, but did regularly hear the gospel or the, 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 the Torah. Um, they seem to have gathered regularly at a synagogue. Um, and they heard the word proclaimed. Um, and and you, you, you run into people like this uh, throughout, throughout the New Testament, both in, uh, in the Gospels, but especially in the book of Acts. When Paul is on his missionary journeys, he's running into a lot of people who are these not quite converted Jewish people, people who have been hearing the message of the Old Testament. Um, and we would, might say believed in the God of the Old Testament, believed in the Jewish God, but did not, as Gentiles, did not um, go so far as to become Jew. Because ultimately, here's the thing. You can be circumcised and you can follow all the laws, but that didn't really make you Jewish. 
what really made you Jewish was being a descendant of Abraham. And there's nothing you could do that could make yourself a descendant of Abraham, right? And so even these people who did uh, go all the way and become Jewish converts, they were still kind of second-class citizens in the in the Jewish synagogue because they might do all the right things, they might be really serious about their faith, but ultimately they had the wrong heritage. Right? They had the wrong genes. They had the wrong blood in their veins. And this too, you know, kind of there are a whole bunch of, I think it was pretty common where people would say, well, what's really the point of going all the way to become a Jew if I'm not going to be a first-class citizen, right? If I'm not going to be equal um, to, to those who happen to be born Jews. So um, it, it did happen, okay? So there were, there were Gentiles who were connected to synagogues, especially outside of Palestine. It just wasn't super common. And it wasn't, it certainly wasn't kind of what the Jews imagined it was going to, that the, the, um, really the Jews imagined that Israel was going to dominate the Gentiles, that the Gentiles were going to kind of be their servants, not that they were going to be equal partners in the gospel. <clears throat> um, we could do it. If we really wanted to talk more about this, you know, we really have to do more of a study of like the book of Acts, especially the early chapter of Acts, like um, Peter at Cornelius's house and, and um, Acts 15, the Jerusalem council. Um, those would really be the sections of the scripture. And then of course, the letter to the Ephesians, where the apostle Paul is specifically addressing this question about to what degree are Gentiles, Gentile believers, God's people, quote unquote, God's people. And, they, and Paul's answer in Ephesians is that they are completely, they are just as much God's people as any Old Testament Jew ever was. That there aren't classes of believers. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then where we ended last week was by talking about verse 18 where when this in this paragraph where Jesus is talking about his love for his sacrificial love for the sheep um where he lays down his life for the sheep no one takes it from him uh and we said this was an especially appropriate reminder for us as we are preparing to celebrate holy week that it may seem like everything is kind of out of control for Jesus that you know that things go a direction he never intended them to go or something like that but we always have to remember this is exactly, this was the plan. This is exactly what God always intended. This is what Jesus always intended to happen. Um, his sacrifice is a willing sacrifice. Uh, un, again, this is unlike the lambs, the Passover lambs of Old, the Old Testament. You know, there weren't, there weren't lambs that were jumping up and saying, pick me to the Passover lamb, pick me. Um, but that's kind of what Jesus is. He's a willing sacrifice. Um, so uh, he he lays down his life. He, it's not taken away from him. Okay, so that kind of takes us through the first 18 verses of John 10, which again is what we've done three of the past six weeks, I think. Um, so, and what we want to do tonight is finish this little section, the first half of John uh, 10, by just looking at the response or the reaction to Jesus' teaching which is in verses 19 to 21. This is should, at least anyway, hopefully, sound super familiar because this is the way that we've seen the crowds react whenever Jesus has some kind of long discourse, whether it was in chapter 5 when he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, in chapter 6 with the bread of life discourse, or in chapter 7 and 8 with the tabernacles discourse. This is one of the themes of John's gospel, one of the repetitions that comes up again and again is that wherever Jesus goes or wherever the gospel of Jesus goes, division follows right alongside of it. There are going to be some who will believe and some who will not. So with that being said, let's read verses 19 to 21. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Now, I think especially for those of you who have the old NIV, the NIV um, 84, the NIV 84 usually does not distinguish. Usually it just, whenever John writes the Jews, it just translates the Jews. 
The NIV 2011, the editors made a decision that um, in many cases, many times when you see the Jews there, you won't just have the Jews, you'll have the Jewish leaders. It'll say the Jewish leaders. Um, and it is an interpretive choice. It is true that the Greek only says the Jews. But um, the, the editors are helping us to remember uh, how many times in John's Gospel, it's, it, it wasn't that Jesus was necessarily rejected by everybody who was Jewish, but especially by the leaders of the Jews. But the, the reason I bring all this up is because you don't, he, you don't have that rendering here in verse 19. It doesn't say the Jewish leaders who heard these words were divided. And so probably what these verses are describing is not just the Jewish leaders. They've kind of been in the crosshairs um, since chapter 9, when the Pharisees opened up the official interrogation of the man born blind, and then his parents, and then back to him. So they've kind of been in the crosshairs. But there's a sense in which these verses is like the camera, a, 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 a movie camera, you know, it's on a, on a, you know, a platform or something, is backing up to give us a wider view of things. So it may be we've been zoomed in for the past you know, chapter and a half on the Jewish leaders, but now we're going to zoom out and we're going to look at the, the, the Jewish crowds as a whole. Okay, um, so that's why um, if you have the NIV 2011, it doesn't, it doesn't say the Jewish leaders who heard these words, but the Jews, um, at least the editors of the NIV are inviting us to think this is a, a larger group of people. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And again, there's that little inclusio that helps us understand that this section of John 10 goes with John 9. All right, so just kind of um, looking, uh, looking back at the sheet um, that I put together for these verses two weeks ago, um, so this was again. This was posted. Um, the, this sheet was posted two weeks ago. If you if you're on the Facebook page, you might have to just go back, scroll down a little bit to find to find that. Um, the first paragraph is just talking about this. How do we understand the term the Jews? Is it the narrower term the Jewish leaders, which is undoubtedly used many times in John's Gospel? Probably not. It's probably the wider wider term. In other words, I I agree with the NIV editors here. And then what we have um, going on here is what we have all, what always goes on in, in John's gospel, really what always goes on whenever the gospel is proclaimed, there's division. Remember that in the synoptic gospels, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the world. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to divide a father against his son and a mother against her daughter and a mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. Um, that members of your own family will be your enemies, will be your adversaries. So um, Jesus reminds us that we shouldn't expect his coming to make everybody happy. Quite the opposite. He, uh, or think of what Simeon said at, at Jesus' circumcision, that this one is going to cause the rising and falling of many in Israel. Um, so uh, this this whole idea, this whole night, kind of 1970s, 1980s idea of Jesus as a hippie, as a 60s hippie, you know, the Jesus as the the peace proclaimer, um, you know, Jesus the the weed smoker, that that kind of guy. Um, that's that's not the Jesus of the Bible. And that's not the that's not the Jesus of the Gospels. The, the Jesus the Jesus of the Gospels did not did not expect that he was going to bring great unity to the world. Um, quite the opposite. He expected that there was going to be great division in the world because of him. At the same time, I will say, there, of course, there is a sense in which Jesus does bring unity to in the church, right? Just think about the different cultures, the different languages, the different races, the different nations that have all become part of the church people who don't look anything the way we look like and don't speak any way that we speak like and don't have any of the customs that we cust that we have, and yet they believe in the same Savior that we believe in and they have the same forgiveness that we have and they're going to go to the same heaven that we're going to go. Uh, 
that is the kind of special unity that Jesus brings, a unity that transcends anything this world has ever seen. But that's not the kind of unity that, you know, that the Beatles or the birds were trying to convince us to believe in in the 60s. Um, it, it's, it's, it's the peace with God that the angels proclaimed on that first Christmas morning. So don't, don't expect Jesus to bring unity to the earth. He's promised that he is going to bring division. So the first group of people that are described in these verses are the, are the haters, okay? Um, and they say he is demon-possessed and raving mad, which is two ways of saying the same thing. Okay, so they're not, they're not making two charges against Jesus. They're making one. It was very common to ascribe um, demon, to demon possession any kind of mental illness, um, any, especially any kind of you know, uh, difficult to explain mental illness like schizophrenia or something like that. Um, so the, uh, they're really two parts of the same charge. And notice that the kind of what they're saying is um, he's, he's a madman. He's a raving lunatic. Just ignore him. Okay? Why listen to him? They're not necessarily calling for Jesus' head here. Okay? They're not, they're not trying to arrest him. They're not picking up stones to stone him. That will come in a few verses. Um, but they're just, they're, they're trying to discredit Jesus. They're trying to, to call his reliability into question um, with this charge that he is a lunatic, um, that, he's the, that he is a shepherd and that other people are sheep and that he's going to lay down his life for sheep and that he and the father are one. They say, look, anybody who says these things must be, must be must be mad, must be, must be a lunatic. So those are the haters. But then in verse 21, you have another group of people who say, well, you know, he doesn't sound like a lunatic. You know, they kind of sound like, well, we've heard lunatics, and this guy doesn't sound like a lunatic. I know that what he's saying is unusual. I know that it's, it's mind-boggling, or it's deep, or it's hard to understand, but it's not crazy. It's not, these aren't the words of a madman. This is, this is not the kind of, uh, of reaction that we're used to seeing with demon possession. And remember, in the Gospels, we see demon possession on a, on a fairly regular basis. And then you also have at the end this rhetorical question, which is, is a great example of a rhetorical question. Can a demon open the eyes of a blind man? Now, um, you and I might answer, sure, <laughs> sure, a demon can open the eyes of a blind man. Um, it's interesting that the question really isn't answered. But this is, again, this is very much the argument that's made in John chapter 9, right? Um, is that, would a, would a blind man, would, would a demon open the eyes? This isn't the kind of things that demons do. Demons don't do healing miracles. Um, they throw people into the fire, or they make make it so that people are so violent that they have have to live out in the cemetery away from everybody else. Or those are the kinds of things that we see in the gospels with demon possessed people. Um, and, and here you have a demon doing the kind, or you you have Jesus who is accused of being a demon doing one of the great healing miracles of the of the Old Testament scriptures that foretold the coming of the messianic age. And of course, the reason this is, become, this is going to become important is because of what's, what's going to happen next. And I know that's not fair for me to do because we haven't gotten there. But in this next section, Jesus is going to talk about, um, you know, whether, whether you like me or not, wh whether you find me offensive or not, judge me based on whether or not I do, I'm doing the works of God. Whether you like me or not, just just be a little unbiased and look at what I'm doing and ask yourself, is this the kind of thing that advances the kingdom of the evil one? Or is this the kind of thing that advances the kingdom of God? Again, to go back to the synoptics, you know, Jesus very famously says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. How can I drive out the devil by the power of the devil? Right? Um, and so just kind of tuck this away in the back of your mind for the next section, 
that you have this kind of rhetorical question. Um, it, it, I think it, it's intended to end on, on an open note. Okay, this is kind of a personal challenge. Every reader of the gospel has to decide. Are you a verse 19 person? Are you a verse 21 person? Are you a person who's going to say, these are the words of the madman, we can just dismiss him, we can dismiss them, we don't have to take them seriously? Or are these words that have to be wrestled with, words that have to be taken seriously, words that have to be taken to heart? Um, are you going to write off the miracles of Jesus as either those of a huckster, you know, a, a trickster, a, a, a sideshow? Um, uh, deceiver or legitimate miracles, but done by a non-divine power? In other words, done by demonic forces? Or are you going to look at those miracles and you're going to say, yeah, those do seem like the miracles of God's one and only Son. Those do match the Old Testament prophecies of what the Messiah would accomplish, um, the signs of the Messianic age. So um, one of the great great literary devices is when you end you end a section with a question when you end on a question you force your readers to wrestle with that question by the way this happens in the book of of jonah the book of jonah ends with a question and god is really asking jonah the question but everybody who reads the book of Jonah has to wrestle with that question. Really, God is asking every reader of the book of Jonah that question. So it's a very effective way of ending the section, not only in that it marks the inclusio of the blind man, but it also kind of brings to a head, it brings every reader to a moment of decision where they are going to have to wrestle with or ignore the words of Jesus. Are you going to take them to heart or are you not? Are you going to be one of his sheep or are you not? Are you going to hear his voice or are you not? Um, so, and again, this is, uh, this, this sets us up for the next section too. Okay, I want to pause there, give you a chance to ask any questions, you, especially about verses 19 to 21, but really we could go all the way back to 10.1 to 21. This first half of John chapter 10, is there any any questions or comments you'd like to make before we move on to our little brief discussion of the Festival of Dedication? I'm not seeing anything come in, though, if you're typing, go ahead and keep typing so that when you press enter, I can see it and I can go back and catch it. But the last thing or the second thing I'd like to do tonight is just to talk a little bit about the Festival of Dedication. So if you still have your Bible open to John chapter 10, you'll notice that in John chapter 10, verse 22, which is the next verse, it says, Then came the Festival of Dedication at Jerusalem. And, and so we want to talk a little bit about the Festival of Dedication, about its background, um, because it does, I think, say something to us, at, at least a little bit, about what is going on here in John chapter 10, though I'm, I might argue that it's more of an issue of what's going on in the gospel as a whole, and hopefully I'll have some time to talk about what I mean by that at the end. Um, I misspoke early. You might have, have heard me try to go back and cover my tracks when I said this is an Old Testament festival. This is what makes the Festival of Dedication unique, is that it isn't an Old Testament festival. So the Old Testament, in the Old Testament scriptures, there are three great Old Testament festivals, three great Jewish festivals. They're called the Three Pilgrim Festivals because they required every able-bodied Jewish man to make a trip to Jerusalem to celebrate. And they are the Passover Tabernacles and Pentecost, and that, those are the order. So Passover was the beginning of the year. Um, Tabernacles was kind of the well; it was way past the middle of the year. It was more toward the end of the year, and then Pentecost marked the end of the year, the end of the harvest. And um, so, if if you or I were studying Passover, our Tabernacles, our Pentecost, 
we'd have to go back to the Mosaic Law and pick up all of the verses that institute that festival. Or we go back and look at the specific celebrations of that particular festival. So, of course, Passover, we go back to Exodus. Or if we were, if we were going to do, um, if we were going to do Tabernacles slash Passover, we could do the Book of Ruth, okay? Because that seems to take, Ruth seems to take place between the two. Um, you can't do that with dedication, with the Festival of Dedication, because the Festival of Dedication was not instituted in the Old Testament. It is an example of a tradition that grew up in the intertestamental period. So, uh, you know, we, we normally like to kind of think about biblical history. Or I think normally we think of biblical history as having two parts, the before Christ part and the after Christ part, or the Old Testament part and the New Testament part. It might be better um, to think of it as having three parts, having ancient Ancient history, Genesis 1, uh, really a book of Genesis, and then, and then the Mosaic era, and then the New Testament era, because what's really kind of neat about that is that there's 400 years between Joseph and Moses, just like there's 400 years between Malachi and John the Baptist. Um, so another, one, of our, one of my uh, Western professors like to say, for some reason, we put an extra page between Malachi and Matthew that says the New Testament. But there's the same amount of time that passes between Genesis and Exodus that really we should put an extra page between those verses too, between those books of the Bible too. Um, so I think it's easy for us as New Testament Christians to think that, okay, so Malachi's done, and then nothing important happened for 400 years, and then there was John the Baptist. But of course, that's not the case. Um, Jews continued to worship, their, and their worship life continued to develop during those what we call the 400 years of silence. And, uh, and one of the things that arose during this time is the Festival of Dedication. Now, I don't want to go into just tons and tons of detail, but you'll um, remember that the, uh, the Old Testament ends with the Persians in charge. Okay, so the Babylonians carry away the southern uh, southern tribe, the southern tribes of Judah. Judah comes back when the Babylonians fall and the Persians rise to power. So the second, the the last part of Old Testament history takes place under Persian rule. However, the uh, the apocalyptic prophets, especially Daniel, but to a lesser degree Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah, um, foretell the rising and falling of multiple kingdoms in the intertestamental period. It's going to go from Babylon to Persia, from Persia to Greece, from Greece to Rome. Um, so this is most famous in the book of Daniel, the statue of the four different metals, or the, the rising of the four different beasts. Okay, so Daniel tells that story two different ways. Um, so we, what we know happens is that the Persians who allowed the Israelites or the Judahites to return home, they get conquered by the Greeks, especially under Alexander the Great. Okay, so Alexander the Great, the great conqueror um, of the Mediterranean world, with a very small but mobile and expert force, is able to destroy the great um, Babylonian or uh, Persian Empire and bring a certain unity to the Mediterranean world that had never been seen before. And uh, uh, this, this actually is very much in the hands of God, God that God wants this to happen, um, because one of Alexander Great's great quests in life is going to be to impose Greek culture on all of the conquered people. And of course, one of the things that means is that all of the conquered people are going to speak the same language, and of course that language is going to be Greek. And so for 200 years, everybody in the Mediterranean world had been forced to learn Greek so that when the New Testament was written, it could be written in Greek and everybody would be able to read it. Okay, um, so Greek becomes the lingua franca of the day. But after Alexander the Great dies, Alexander the Great dies at the age of 33, very young, um, and he deserved it. Uh, if you want, you want more about that, you can read about it. Um, but uh, his, and after he, he dies, his kingdom is divided into four parts among his four generals. Uh, and the, the most important areas for the Bible, for, the, for biblical history, 
Um, of course, uh, the promised land, which is going to be um, controlled by the Seleucids, and then the Egypt is going to be ruled by the Ptolemies. And um, they're going to, the intertestamental period is really all about the fights or the battles between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. They're going to constantly be fighting over the promised land. Well, one of these guys who arises from the Seleucid Empire, from the, the Greek from the Greek peoples that ruled over the north um, uh, uh, area of the Promised Land, um, his name is going to be Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus the Fourth. And uh, Antiochus, at the very beginning of his reign, in, uh, enjoys a lot of success against the Ptolemies. Um, it's kind of interesting. This period, intertestamental period, is kind of back and forth between the Ptolemies rise, they're, they're dominant over the Seleucids, and then the, it gets flipped, and then it flips back, and then it flips back again. Well, when Antiochus IV arises to power, the Ptolemies are really on top. And Antiochus has, is able to win some great victories against the Egyptians, but then the tide starts to turn against him. He, gets, he, he uh, attacks the city of Alexandria, which of course is the Greeks, you know, named after Alexander the Great, so it's the the great Ptolemaic capital, and he gets turned away. And on his way back, uh, after getting kind of beaten at Alexandria, he's kind of working his way back home, and he goes to the Promised Land, and just because he's mad, um, he takes like 80,000 Jews into slaves, as slaves. Um, this was the kind of guy that Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes was. He was, he was a scoundrel. He was, you know, on the 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 most infamous people in the Bible, he would be, make the top five, or not, not in the Bible, but uh, he is um, specifically prophesied about in the book of Daniel. He is a type of the Antichrist, the great opponent of God's people. Um, as you can imagine, the Jewish people very much resisted Alexander the Great's efforts to enforce Greek culture on them, because of course Greek culture, becoming Greek culture meant worshiping the Greek gods, and no self-respecting Jew is going to do that. And so um, the Anti when Antiochus IV comes around, he basically is tired of the Jews not Hellenizing, not becoming Greek. And so he actually makes worship of the one true God illegal. He makes possessing any part of the Old Testament scripture is a capital offense. You and your whole household would be executed if they found any part of the Torah in your, in, in your possession. And then, most famously, he ordered his soldiers to enter into the temple and to set up on top of the altar of burnt offering a statue of Zeus. And... Um, He's called Antiochus Epiphanes. That may, it may sound familiar to you. You're saying the season of Epiphany. Remember during the season of Epiphany, Jesus makes himself known as God. He reveals himself to be God. And Antiochus called himself Antiochus Epiphanes because he thought he was God. So on the statue of Zeus that he has set up on the, the, on the altar of burnt offering, the face of the guy on the statue of Zeus is Antiochus's face. So basically he's claiming to be Zeus there. So here you have, on the altar of Israel, on the altar in which all of Israel's sacrifices is, are supposed to be offered, you have Antiochus, a Greek unbeliever, setting up a, a, a shrine, a, a, a altar, to Zeus, the king of the Greek pantheon. And this is for one group um, of, the Jew, of the Jewish people of that day. This is the last straw. This is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And under the leadership of the Maccabees, um, Judas Maccabeus, uh, or he's sometimes called the hammer of God, uh, he begins what, what we would call, really, what we would call guerrilla warfare. He, he, he organizes these kind of rebel strike Think, think like Star Wars. Um, these kind of rebel strike forces against the against Antiochus's uh, um, uh, forces. And by the way, I should just mention that the day that 
the day that Antiochus set up that statue was the 25th day of Kislev, which is basically December, okay? So what we would call December. So 25th of Kislev, 167 BC is when um, that, that statue was, was set up. So Judas Maccabeus um, leads this, this kind of rebel force and start striking against the the forces of Antiochus Epiphanes, and he has great success. Um, at, great success, and when he dies, uh, then all of a sudden you've got a whole lot of people that want to join Judas Maccabeus, and he becomes really popular. Uh, there is this kind of groundswell of Jewish support, and they basically throw. Antiochus the fourth out of the Holy Land. Um, they certainly drive them out of Jerusalem, out of Palestine. They recapture the temple, and three years to the day, so three years, it was 167, 25th of Kislev, 167, that he set up the image. And I was on 25th, 25th of Kislev in 164, so three years later, that the Maccabeans rededicate the temple to the one true God. And this is what the Festival of Dedication is all about. It is the annual commemoration of when the Maccabean revolt rescued the temple from the atrocities of Antiochus IV Epiphanes and re-established the, one, the worship of the one true God. Um, they decided to make it uh, a festival that was celebrated the same way the three Old Testament festivals were, Passover, Tabernacles, and Pentecost. It was an eight-day festival, begins with a special um, Sabbath and ends with a Sabbath. Um, and they called it the Festival of Dedication, which in Hebrew is Hanukkah. Okay, so this is, um, when we talk about the Festival of Dedication, we're talking about Hanukkah. What, what, what Jews today celebrate as Hanukkah. So you say, well, they didn't celebrate Hanukkah in the Old Testament. You're right, they didn't, because it's not an Old Testament festival. It's a, it's a festival that developed in the intertestamental period. Now, um, you probably know the story of why it's called Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights, the miraculous provision of oil as the, Jew, as the Maccabeans are being besieged by Greek forces and you know, if, if their oil had run out, they wouldn't would have been able to stand, and God mirac supposedly miraculously allowed them um, to survive. Um, this was commemorated, uh, the way this was commemorated is that it's, it was common in the time of Christ for Jewish people to set up lamps or candles in their windows. Um, so, by the way, if you've ever set up a candle in your window for Christmas, it's really more of a Jewish tradition than it is a, 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 Christmas, a Christian tradition. Um, but because of this, because of its close association with light, hopefully this rings a bell. Because the Festival of Tabernacles is the Festival of Light. Remember the, the four huge torches that they light during the Festival of Tabernacles? And so um, I think it's Josephus. I thought I had this in the notes, but I guess I don't. Um, I think it's Josephus who calls the festival, uh, he calls dedication the uh, tabernacles in the month of Kislev. <laughs> so, but really, they thought about it as kind of another tabernacle or a mini tabernacles. The difference was, unlike the three pilgrim festivals, Passover, Tabernacles, and Pentecost, Hanukkah could be celebrated wherever you were. You didn't have to make a special trip to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And of course, this is especially important, is going to be especially important for the Jews after 70 AD. What do you do when you don't have a temple anymore? What do you do with your temple festivals when you don't have a temple anymore? Well, this is why Hanukkah becomes so important, because it's a festival that isn't tied to the temple. It can be celebrated wherever you are. Now, why is the why is this important? Well, I, I'll say a couple of things. It's important because it helps uh, because it, for some reason, 
that I can't necessarily fully explain. John decides to drop this little line at the beginning of verse 22. Hey, it was the time of the festival of dedication. Now, the question is going to be, why does he tell us that? What is he trying to signal to us by telling us that? We are going to hear that Jesus is not in the temple courts, or at least he's not out in the temple courts. He's walking through Solomon's colonnade. Why is he walking in Solomon's colonnade? A couple of reasons. First of all, because it's cold. It's December. Okay? So it's the end of the year. It's winter. And so uh, it, it's not the time to be out in the temple courts. Like later for Passover, it'll be in the spring. It'll be a little warmer. Also, he's in Solomon's colonnade because, of course, the rededication of the temple always called to mind the dedication of the temple. The rededication was done by Judas Maccabeus. The dedication had been done by Solomon. And so many of the uh, Festival of Dedication's rites were, were intentionally built around the kinds of things that we read in, uh, when the temple was dedicated in Chronicles. So the fact that he's in Solomon's colonnade is significant because Solomon is the builder of the temple. But then finally, like Passover, Pentecost, and uh, same in order, Passover, Tabernacles, and Pentecost, all three of which have messianic overtones to them. Okay, Passover is the lamb who's going who's gonna to die. Um, tabernacles is the, uh, the water of life, the one who brings the water of life, the light of the world. And then Pentecost is you know, the one who brings the, the culmination of the end of the age, the great harvest of the great feast. Okay, these are all messianic images. It's not surprising that the fourth, temp, the fourth festival, the quote-unquote unofficial festival, takes on messianic overtones too. And so it's, uh, I think the reason why John drops this little bombshell in chapter 22 um, is because he's returning to the theme that we've seen run throughout John's gospel, that Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah by revealing himself as the typological fulfillment of the Old Testament worship life of Israel, specifically the Old Testament temple. So we had in chapter 2, Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it again. You've got um, in chapter 5, Jesus heals the man at the pool of Bethesda, which is near the temple. And you've got Jesus as the fulfillment of tabernacles in 7 and 8. That's a temple festival. And of course, he's going to be sacrificed at Passover, which is a temple festival. Um, you'll notice that the, um, look at verse, so verse 22 tells us is the festival of dedication. Look at verse 24. The Jews who were gathered around him asking, as, say, as saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Why did they ask that? Why are they thinking Messiah? Well, they're thinking Messiah because the festival of dedication was widely thought of as a messianic festival, just like Passover, Tabernacles, and Pentecost. This, this was something that was on the mind of people at the time of dedication. Um, is this... Is when is the Messiah who's going to be the next hammer of God, who's going to drive away not the Greeks but the Romans? When is he going to get here? Right? When are we going to be able to rededicate our temple without this Greek fortress called the Antonia right next to it, so they can look over and see what we're doing? Who's going to be the one who's going to rescue us from Roman oppression the way that Moses rescued us from Egyptian oppression and Judas Maccabeus rescued us from Greek oppression? All these kind of thoughts are wrapped up in the idea of the festival of, of dedication. And by dropping that little line at the beginning of verse 22, John is contributing to a theme that runs through the whole gospel, which is Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah as the typological fulfillment of temple festivals. Okay, um, so... Uh, I, I have a few more things to say about that next week when we get into the next section, um, verses 22 to 30. But for now, I just kind of wanted to explain what's unique about dedication. It isn't an Old Testament festival. It arises from the intertestamental period 
and yet it gets it's kind of the fourth unofficial festival it's viewed as being a high festival like uh passover tabernacles and pentecost even though it doesn't have the old testament um institution that those three festivals did and that ultimately this chapter like like all of john is contributing to painting this picture of jesus as the messiah the typological fulfillment of all that god had promised or foretold and the worship life especially the temple of his old testament people yeah, before I get to John's question, I have a question from Rachel, which was, was there anything wrong with the Jews setting up an extra festival? Technically speaking, no. Okay, technically speaking, no. Um, in other words, God doesn't, God doesn't necessarily say you have these three festivals and only these three festivals, right? Um, to some degree, they, they had, I, I wouldn't necessarily say they had a great amount of freedom, like we do, but they had some measure of freedom. Um, in, in terms of what their rights were going to be. Now, what may make your eyebrows rise a little bit is the way that it's kind of viewed on the same level as the three Old Testament instituted festivals. That might have gotten on God's nerves a little bit. Okay, now maybe I'll get to heaven and God tell me I shouldn't have said that. But, uh, you know, just it, that it, it doesn't have the Old Testament institution that the other three do. So it's it's not that it's bad to add a festival. I think the question we have to ask ourselves, or the Jewish people had to ask ourselves, is is it right to elevate this extra festival to the same level as the three divinely established festivals, which they really did seem to do? And kind of the fact that John mentions it in a Christian context is really a big support of the fact that, that they did. Okay, John. <clears throat> With John giving credence to this festival, and given the fact that it was not established in the Old Testament, isn't John in effect saying there is a, another source of authority besides Word of God, which would be tradition, which when you did the seminar on the Catholic Church pointed out that the Catholic Church has two sources of knowledge, mm -hmm. scripture and tradition. So isn't tradition becoming uh, a source of church teaching? Here? Okay, so John's question is by, uh, uh, I'm just gonna kind of rephrase it, but the festival of dedication does not have the Old Testament warrant institution that the other three do. And yet by mentioning it here, does John kind of put a divine it's an inspired stamp of approval on the festival of dedication, which really in and of itself is a tradition. It's not scripture, it's tradition, right? And I guess I'd say two things. I'd say um, John is not afraid to use whatever tool at his, is at his disposal to make the point that he wants to make that Jesus is the Messiah. And that just because an inspired writer incorporates something that isn't inspired does not necessarily mean that they are raising that thing to the same level as inspiration. So the two great examples of that are the Apostle Paul um, preaching in Athens, and he quotes, uh, and I forget which one, but one of the Greek poets and his sermon to the, to the Athenians. Well, just because he quotes the Greek poets doesn't make the Greek poet inspired, right? Um, Paul is just using something that is in the foreground, something that is in his audience's knowledge to, as a bridge to a greater point. The same thing is, and the trickier thing, is when Jude does it. In the book of Jude, Jude quotes the book of Enoch, which is a apocryphal book this whole thing about moses and the devil arguing over the body of moses that's in the book of enoch um and um and what, what we'd say is the same thing um everybody who read the book of jude had read the book of enoch and so uh, jude is able to refer to this 
it, it would kind of it's kind of like when I refer to Star Wars. I'm not I'm not really afraid that anybody watching this video has never seen Star Wars. When when Jude refers to Enoch, it's because he's not really afraid that anybody hasn't heard the story from Enoch about um, about Michael and the devil ar arguing over Jesus' body. But that does, just because Jude decides to use Enoch doesn't necessarily make Enoch inspired, right? Um, he's calling to mind something that was in the collective consciousness of his audience to make the inspired point, which is don't blaspheme. So I'm not sure that I would be comfortable saying that John is raising tradition to the level of Scripture as much as what John is doing is using the fact that the Jews had raised tradition to the level of Scripture as in his depiction of, of Jesus' messianic office. In the very same way that Paul uses a Greek poet to make his point to the Athenians, or that Jude uses the book of Enoch to make a point to his audience. Just because a write, an inspired writer quotes something doesn't mean that what he quotes is in necessarily inspired. Question, uh, I don't see it. He says, was it instituted by God? Is that what makes establishing a festival right or wrong? Okay, so Heidi's question is, was uh, the, I'm assuming she means the festival dedication. Mm -hmm. Was the festival dedication instituted by God? The answer is no, it wasn't. There's no divine word for de dedication. It's just some. It's something that it's really what it's kind of like is the. It's kind of like the Jewish Fourth of July is what it's like. Okay, we shoot off fireworks on the Fourth of July because we ran those British people out of our country. We are independent now, right? And they celebrated the festival of dedication because they drove those Greeks out of Palestine, and they were independent again. They were worshiping their God again. Now, the difference is that our Fourth of July isn't necessarily a religious festival, whereas theirs is not, it's not just national, but it's also religious. But it really is just kind of a commemoration of a historical event. There's no divine in, uh, institution of it, right? There's no command to remember it. Um, I'd say, similarly, is there really a command to celebrate Christmas? Is, is there any verse of the Bible that says that we have to commemorate the birth of Jesus? That's really, in our Christian freedom, we choose to do that. Um, it's not required that, no, you might say, oh, yes, it is, Pastor. But, um, but, uh, but, you know, scripturally speaking, it's not required that we have the festival of Christmas. That is something in our Christian freedom we're choosing to commemorate, or or whatever Pentecost, or or um, the Ascension, or or whatever, right? Um, so, uh, so it, it has no divine command. Um, it it is purely a historical thing. And again, I, just like I'd say, we have the freedom to create festivals like like Christmas. I think God's Old Testament people had the freedom to create rituals or festivals like this. What I'm not so sure about is whether God would have been pleased with them putting it on the same level as the divinely or ordained, uh, ordained festivals. That's the part that makes me a little uncomfortable. Not that they created a festival. That I think they had the, the right to do. But that they would elevate the festival to the same level as those three special festivals. I think it would kind of be like if we made up a new sacrament. And we lifted it up on the same level as the Lord's Supper and baptism, right? There's really, there's no Bible passage that says that defines a sacrament. If you want to define a sacrament in a, in a broad enough way as to have seven of them, you go, you go right ahead. It's not that it's anti-biblical. But if you're going to do that, then you've got to call the baptism and the Lord's Supper something different. Because those two are on a whole different level than the other five. Those two are the ones instituted by Christ during his earthly ministry, where a visible earthly element is connected um, to God's word that actually conveys forgiveness of sins, new life, and salvation. Nothing else does that. Only the Lord's Supper and baptism does that. So if you're going to call the sacraments sacraments, then you've got to call the Lord's Supper and baptism whatchamacallits or whatever. you just got to call them something different. You can't put them on the same level 
as those two things. Again, I think the Jews had the freedom to create a festival. But the part that I'm not so sure about, you'd have to kind of talk to a rabbi, I think. But why, why could they let lift dedication to that level, the level of Pentecost and Passover and Tabernacle? That's the part that that I am not that I think maybe pushes it pushes the line a little bit. Okay, so thank you for letting me fill the hour with just those two verses or three verses. Um, I will have a lesson next week for twenty two to thirty ready for us to go. So hopefully you can join us again next uh, Sunday, same um, bat time, same bat location, and we will um, close with prayer. So we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would fill our hearts, our minds, and our lives with your peace as we go out into the world to serve as your witnesses so that everyone with whom we speak might become as we are, believers in you as our Lord and Savior. We ask this in all things in your holy name. Amen. Blessings, everyone, and uh, have a great week.